Welcome. There we go. <clears throat> Welcome to the Visiting Artists Lecture Series. Thank you all for coming. Our first guest um, speaker today is new faculty in ceramics. Though not technically a visiting artist, he and his family just moved here from the Bay, and he currently has a solo exhibition in the gallery <clears throat> adjacent here in the theater lobby. Um, please join me in welcoming Wesley Wright. All right, thanks guys. Well, definitely an honor to be here. Um, yeah, and just here in the broader sense at Mendocino College to be, to be chosen to be the head of the ceramics department, you know, to, to have a home here, so. Uh, and thanks, Jasmine, for putting this together. Thank you, David Wolf, for putting this together as well, and all the folks, Melinda, uh, for putting the show together and taking good care of it. So I am a teacher, uh, as you know, and an artist. I've taught at nine different colleges over the past 10 years. And yes, now I have arrived. Um, so I'll talk about my, my journey as a artist, as a teacher, uh, my process, and my art itself. So I grew up in Berkeley. Anybody know who this guy is? Gravy. 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 Gravy, yes. And I feel like he's sort of emblematic of certain aspects of my upbringing in the sense that you know, he was a creative, he was free, felt free to be who he wanted to be. He was political, he was a showman. Um, so, you know, I, I felt that freedom. And I wanted to show you guys, the first, one of the first things I did, I'm gonna start early, was in high school, um, one of the first endeavors that I did that showed me that I had the potential of making a career in art was that I created this singing Muppet on a public access TV show for my senior project. And the Berkeley uh, public access TV station was right there at my high school. And they're like, what do you want to do for your senior project? And I was like, I'm going to make Muppets. And it came together. I had some really talented friends to collaborate with. So that was one. And the other one was my class t-shirt. So. <laughs> My mom's laughing. She's in the audience here because she was uh, part of the. Anyway, so she she funded me to make this T-shirt. I was not happy with a lot of the class T-shirts that had been coming out in the past, and like I wanted I wanted to do the shirt. I wanted to do the official shirt. So I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna make my own. So my buddy and I made this bootleg shirt. We borrowed money from my mom, printed a bunch of them, and it was a hit. We sold a whole bunch of them, and then. Um, tell the principal was like, "You're in big trouble. You gotta collect all those shirts. We're gonna call your mother." And I was like, "Call my mother. She gave me the money to do the shirts." The shirt, the shirt. Thanks, mom. Speaking of shirts, here's a shirt I made for Humboldt State. So after high school, I went to Humboldt State. It used to be a laundromat. And so it's called The Laundry. And um, there, I was studying drawing and painting, and I had a sculpture teacher who was really conceptual, and he wasn't into making things. He wore like fancy clothes and never got dirty. And I didn't like the vibe in there. I didn't want to make, I wanted to make objects. I wanted to get dirty. And my buddy Evan Hobart, who used to teach here, he, um, I went to, yeah, he was a friend from Humble, and he's like, dude, you gotta check out ceramics. So I went across the hall and went into the ceramics department and never looked back. So I started, I was mostly into sculpture, but I did a lot of pottery as well, and I developed a line of 
functional face pots. That was kind of my bread and butter. And they were kind of popular. I sold them at coffee shops and sold them at uh, craft fairs. Life was cheap. And so um, that that's another thing that pushed me towards the viability of a, of a ceramics career. Another uh, path that I considered was being a two-headed monster in the circus. I was uh, part of the Humboldt Circus and into juggling and we did this whole vaudeville show. And at some point I had to choose between two uh, difficult career paths and I chose ceramics. <laughs> Keith Schneider was uh, one of my teachers at Humboldt State and probably the most influential teacher on my work, especially in terms of surfaces. He's really good at these low fire, really refined, layered color surfaces, a lot of dry brushing. That's, these are techniques that I still teach today. And so I've always seen him as one of my major mentors. And at Humboldt State, that's where I developed my first professional quality body of work. And this was one of those pieces, this is migration sensation. And I was going with this theme of these disembodied heads with morphing parts. What, what might this one be called? Mind over matter. Uh, and this one is the eyeballogist. So these kind of visual metaphors, um, they, you know, they make, you, make you think a little bit, and they're fun, they're playful. And I was always into this idea of creating realism in order to get the viewer to buy into the reality, the fantasy that I want to, to bend, right? To kind of pull the viewer into my fantasy with realistic rendering. So here's... So my teachers, Jim Crawford, Nancy Fraser, and Millie Landis, not my teacher, she's my wife, uh, and Keith Schneider. So ceramics necessitates help, assistance, uh, group effort. And so there's just a natural community vibe that happens. And you know, ceramics is more than a, being an artist is not a profession as much as a lifestyle in many ways, and um, so community helps you grow as an artist, as a person, and that's been, been a theme in my life. So at Humboldt State, I went there, I took a long time to graduate, and then I stuck around even longer after I graduated, because I was, they didn't, I mean, they didn't make me leave, and it was a really great studio. They had this fake grad school program where they put this building, kind of a hallway off the back side of the ceramic studio. And it was called the Honors Program. It actually used to be a graduate program. And there was a really great group of folks back there. And I met my wife, Malia, and our cubbies were right next to each other. And we've been a team and a partnership and creativity business and love ever since. Our One of our good friends, our greatest collaborator in the studio was Avery Palmer and still a good friend. And the three of us became kind of a creative unit. And it was always inspiring and motivating to see what he was doing. He's just a machine just busting out these crazy, trippy, detailed, super refined sculptures. And so he kind of would show me what's possible. And, and I was a real motivator. And of course, Malia, you know, motivated me in, a, in the same way. And having an extra set of eyeballs on your work to give you some, some better perspective and a companion to get you through those long hours in the studio. So we, the three of us applied to grad school and we got into, we all three of us got into San Jose State, where we were known as the Humboldt Tripod. <laughs> uh, um, so, grad school, I think some people think that grad school is going to make them into an artist. 
But I would say if you're thinking about grad school, you need to go in there with your own vision, your own ideas. You're there to grow and learn, but you have to kind of stick to your, your vision, and you have to have a vision before you go if you're going to use your time well. Because grad school, they want to shake you up, and some people who are not confident in what they're doing, they get shaken up, and then they don't even know where they're trying to go or what they're trying to do anymore. So, um, just wanted to put that out there. So, it was a materials-based education in a lot of ways. There was a lot of making happening, but there's also a heavy conceptual bend to it. And there was this debate that's still, still a thing that people talk about in the art world. Grad school is like the debate between the artist with the ideas and the create the the person who actually makes it. And there are a lot of people that say it doesn't matter who makes it, it's about the idea. But as someone who's a craftsman, um, you know, I feel like the idea and the object are inseparable, that the touch of the artist is really important. And so I kept having to argue that point in in class and, and it, it was good for me to to stick up for for myself and and my my sort of cohort, my fellow creators, physical craftsmen. And this was a piece that I made that was kind of like anti-conceptual. It was to make something big and bold and undeniably silly and sort of opposed to all this like artsy fartsy mumbo jumbo. Not that there isn't validity to conceptual art, um, just some of it goes a little too, a little too far in terms of, you know, anyway, moving on. Uh, so, uh, you know, we I talk about relationships, and so I, I met a lot of great people that I learned a lot from. Jordan Malixi is a painter, uh, Patrick Kingshill, who actually started in Humboldt, in the way that he used uh, pottery and brought it into the sculptural realm and was also a woodworker and how he had all these materials interacting. Ryan Carrington who really got me into mold making and, um, and Esteban Salazar and some other glass artists who I worked with. Um, also Matt Eaton, here he is making a, oh wait, hold on, I can't skip Stan Monica. So Monica Abandoned Duel was one of my teachers. Uh, Stan Welsh as well, and I would say they didn't teach me as much technique as they showed me sort of how to function as an artist and help give me some more direction and really critical feedback. It was more of the students and people around me that I learned from. So I collaborated with glass artist um, Matt Eaton made these really cool horns for my rhinoceros, and we figured out a mold system to be able to get them to fit perfectly. And then, this is a collaboration with Malia Landis, my wife, we, we collaborate from time to time. She does these really beautiful, she's known for her really beautiful, intricate paper clay porcelain work. Um, and in grad school, I, did, I switched from humans to animals, but in a lot of ways, I feel like I was still making humans. When I was making those heads and other figures, there's some baggage to tap, attached to the human form, identity, gender, like time, like the styles of time, or people want to project all these things onto a human form, whereas an animal, even though I see them kind of as people, and in people, as people in the sense of like, in storytelling, mythology, animals are often stand-ins for people, they're kind of, these are kind of anthropomorphized um, animals. And they have more, they can have more expression, more texture, and just be more interesting. So I still kind of see them as people in a way. And I got better with computers, and turned some of my sculptures into GIFs, and um, you know, I just, I love Photoshop, it's a lot of fun. And it helped to put some of my, my drawings and my it, um, digital collages help kind of put some of my sculptures into a context. So this one's a refugee 
know, if you can't live in your home, where are you going to go? So it's kind of the absurdity of, of our relationship to our environment. And screen printing, I turned some of my sculptures into screen prints, t-shirt designs, and then drawings that where I would use actual terracotta clay dust as a ground to blend in and out of and help kind of fill in the gaps in this story that I was starting to create in my work. And in grad school, they also have you look, look deep within yourself, right? Look at your inspirations. Where do they come from? And, you know, why do I like to make? And my parents are definitely a big influence. So here's my dad and there's my mom in the mirror taking the picture. And my dad is a carpenter and he's a real, he was a student of the, the craftsman movement. He was an art student as well. He's a really creative guy, but he put a lot of his um, creativity into his, his carpentry. And one of his mentors was Marty Pelotowski. And I always admired some of the like stained glass and the doors and there'd be like burnt wood and copper and it's like, this materiality, the beauty of the material and allowing it to, to speak. And I feel like that's something that was ingrained in me is like being around these beautiful things and seeing them being made. And so that was really inspiring. Just like work, making stuff. And also the church that I grew up going to, kind of a progressive Berkeley, kind of hippie church in a way, but um, you know, pretty serious about their their ideas and that some people were interested in ideas of Joseph Campbell and, and as I became older I started thinking about that. The commonalities of mythologies, religious anthropology, like what's similar, the similar stories that humans tell themselves and how that kind of points to the commonality of the human experience. And so I started thinking about myths and if we were to adapt our myths for our current circumstances, if, if some of the Western mythology tells us, has led us to a, a place where we're depleting our environment, like what's the mythology that could get us out of it? Or, um, and so I started thinking about these ideas, and I like the idea of the ark, like an ark that could protect all of the genetic diversity of the planet. And so, I made this turtle, and also this this meme, this idea of the the world tortoise, and it appears in a lot of different myths, Iroquois myths, um, a cloud woman who falls down to earth and is uh, the animals help her make a home, a world on the back of a turtle. There's a Hindu myth as well, and also referencing Romulus and Remus with these teats on there, like the founding twins, hero twins of Rome, and then it's got these claws where it can do its own hunting, and then it's got this biodome where it's protecting, it's protecting its environment or some biodiversity. And then this is a more recent one. Some of these aren't from grad school, but all still part of the same ideas, ideas that we're still exploring today. So this one's also a, an arc, a vessel, and it could be underwater, it could be in outer space, but I imagine this guy's being like huge. And these windows are like tiny little windows where all the little animals inside could look out. And just experimenting with materials now, like because mold making is such a part of my process, I will sculpt something, this one I sculpted the tusks, and then I cut them off and I made a rubber mold and cast them in resin so that they can take the light and glow. And I love bringing creatures to life, putting a face on them, like getting all those details in there. And then after a while, it's like, oh, I gotta show this guy some respect. This is like a little, it's like a living creature. And I just love that feeling of like bringing something to life and creating in sort of alchemy machine, like its own some implied logic and order to it. And I mean, some people will be like, oh, that's steampunk. And like, you know, steampunk, it, you know, there's some cool things like, but I feel like that 
aesthetic for itself as like a fashion is can be like a little bit superficial. Like I'm I'm interested like literally in implying that this thing is like some sort of machine and like the, and also contrast is really interesting. The contrast between the organic and the mechanical but you constantly put the computer. Using resin, I love that like model trains and all the little environments that they make these dioramas. So I got all into that stuff. I've a closet full of little turf trees and fun things like that. Some of my work honors native California species. So this one, the California coyote, and then the California poppies grafted onto the surface. And a lot of these protectors, you know, they're they're sort of like the archetype of that animal, almost like a god, or just they're and they're kind of in this meditative state in a way. And this one, sort of what I was talking about earlier with the idea of a if you're this is called the flaws of dead reckoning. If your system of navigation is not working and it might cause you to crash then maybe you need to change your system of navigation. And also, just aesthetically, um, formally, thinking about creating an interesting contour, contrast. So there's some, in my work, I'm trying to find where the narrative, the message, uh, and the, the visual, visually interesting, compelling, image, like where do they all come together? And when, when all those meet in a really perfect way, in a balanced way, like that's what some of the best art really is. So imagining uh, this mole is scouring the detritus of a depleted world and collecting parts that it can use to modify its friends. If they can't adapt fast enough, then they will have their little mole friends help them adapt. And then there's a sculpture that I made of it. First came the drawing. I do sketch out most of my more serious sculptures, um, not in detail, but more as a plan, how I'm going to engineer it, what the gesture is going to be. But some of them do become more elaborate drawings. This, this drawing is a little bit different in style, but I feel like it's pretty appropriate for the moment we're in where you know, nation states or powerful people will fight against each other and maybe the people on the inside of those institutions might have leveler heads or might unite over their humanity and a hope that maybe they can. Here's two rivals occupying the same space, one having some modifications to survive, this kind of Da Vinci-esque uh, modification in the wings. And so the barn owl might be sort of the invader or the colonizer versus the great horned owl. Um, I mean, the, the barn owls are native to, the, to this area, but the, the great horned owls are more kind of specialized and like historically native to the area. And where we were living in Crockett, Northeast Bay, there would always be, I'd be working in my studio, I'd be, sometimes I'd be working outside and hear like, like the barn owl and I hear like, the, the great horned owl, like they're they getting along with the fight. So I graduated from grad school. And what now, right? What are you going to do? And luckily, I had been, I had an art practice, I had some connections, and I was proactive looking for job opportunities and applying to shows. And so when I got out of school, it was okay. It's a, it's a really hard time for a lot of people. And it was kind of scary, but I did get my first adjunct teaching position, first of many. At, when I was at Santa Clara University, 
and started having shows, a lot of them in Oakland, uh, part of the Oakland Art Murmur, and in the uh, La Luz de Jesus Gallery, that was like a gallery that I always admired, and it was kind of a dream to have a show there, and so I was very happy that I got a show there, some shows with Malia, so here's just a little video of some stuff from the Open Art Murmur, it's a monthly art walk, and so after the Great Recession, a lot of businesses, especially downtown Oakland and uptown, had closed down, and so artists took over these spaces, had cheap rent, and art fueled the the scene, and there's live music and performers and vendors. That's Derek Van Beers, the owner of Roscoe Gallery, who's a really great staple of the, the Murmur, and then here's a bunch of friends from the Art Murmur and the Strangs World. And so, we put together a group of artists, like-minded, similar aesthetic artists, kind of similar age group, and we got several shows, and our crowning achievement was that we put together a show at the National Ceramics Conference that happens every year uh, in Sika, and this was in, when it was in Oregon, and we put on a show up there that was pretty popular and successful, so. Collaborate, find like-minded people, and you never know who's going to be, you know, helping make things happen for you. So there's a lot of artists that I looked up to, um, and artisan especially, and I reached out to artists that I admired, and most of them responded. And before I knew it, a lot of these artists that had been. Um, just somebody out there who was like, wow, I want to be like them someday, became my, my friends and my peers. A lot of them were students of Artisan. Juan Xing Zhang, Tony Natsoulis, Lisa Reinertsen, and then Clayton Bailey, who's like the mad scientist of ceramics. And some of them, I even helped them with some projects. Lisa Reinertsen helped her with a mold project, and my son modeled for one of her sculptures. So here's our studio. We had a live work space in Oakland and Fruitvale. We lived there for about four years. And it was a really cool time, really fun time. Uh, and Lilia was developing her work. And she had two directions, really, with her work. One is salt and earth where she does a lot of screen printed porcelain with astrological signs and maps on them. And she worked with anthropology and some other companies to design for them and they produced the work, the companies produced the work. And she did shell dishware, abalone shells and then mussel shells. And eventually she started working with some designers that really um, loved her work, this whole network of designers and lately she's been continuing to do these really cool installation, like modular installation pieces in people's houses with porcelain sculptures of flowers. A lot of them are really in her wheelhouse and so she's getting to make the work that she loves to make and it's paid for, you know, before it's made. So versus the gallery route, which can, which can be really difficult. If you, you're only gonna, you make it, you're only gonna get half. You, you don't know, you gotta ship it, it's gonna break. But this has been a really great route for her. This was some sea flowers, this cool abstract uh, project she did. But check her out her Instagram, Malia Landis, and also Salt and Earth. She has two different Instagram accounts. So while we were living in Oakland, I was doing a lot of different projects with, between teaching, making art, and then I started working with Youth Spirit Artworks, which is an organization in Berkeley that works with homeless youth to help teach them interpersonal skills and give them work experience all through the creation of art projects, a lot of them public art projects. So I collaborated with these folks on a mosaic or relief mural that went on the front of their building 
and it honored Francis Towns, who was one of their founders and major donors. And we did workshops with schools and churches, and we're, the idea was to get as many people involved as possible. And I'd love to do something like this, uh, get one of my classes involved, get the community involved, and maybe we can do a project like this in Kayak. So here I am assembling parts in my studio. And like, yeah, figuring out ways that anybody can contribute. People who have more skills, like the a lot of the members of YSA sculpted the birds and the fishes. And then anybody could just write on one of these tiles and they put their, you know, some, I forget what the, what the theme, well, the theme was, visions of Mother Nature, so it's kind of like, what do you, how do you see Mother Nature? And so people would write that on the tile, and the tiles became the, the tiles of the sky, so it's like almost like putting a prayer up into the sky, so I like that metaphor. And then the hills, it's like anybody can just stick their hand in this clay, just squish their hand in it, and then their fingerprint is on the, you know, and here's a video of it. There's also a bench, so I made these turtles out of, clay and then cast them in concrete and then did pressings of native species, native plant species and put them all on the mosaic. I taught a lot of workshops, mold making, animal portraiture, and a lot of teaching. And I didn't I never wanted to rely on my work to make a living. I mean, if people were breaking my door down to buy the weird stuff that I make, that would be awesome. But the reality of it is that often an artist will have to reproduce something. Like they find, even a sculptor inevitably is producing a product for a market. And you have to find where your aesthetic, the things you like to make, Fit, fit in the market. And people get stuck making the same things over and over. Um, I mean, some people are able to have a lot of freedom in that, but I like teaching. I love helping people achieve their creative vision. I love collaborating. And I see myself sometimes as the head student. You know, I'm always experimenting and learning as well. So that path has really worked for me. So process, let's talk a little bit about process. How does one make a chicken head turn into a fish? First you make a chicken head and you make fish. Then you make a mold of each one and then you cut and assemble the various stages in between. So by cutting and splicing these parts together, I can create this really incremental morph. And so my carpenter father always told me to work smart and not hard. And molds and spring, spring molds, stamps really helped me to do that. So rather than sculpt every scale on the fish, I could make the stamp and then I could stamp that scale texture onto the fish. And then I created this motor that's on, that helps the propeller rotate and so I make molds of gears, these little stamps of screws, I just took clay and stuck it on the back of a screw and fired it and then I have a screw stamp. Assemble all those together and you get a fish propeller motor. <laughs> this piece is made mostly with um, press molded some slip cast parts all assembled together. And I was thinking about the human machine that animals are subjected to. And this is the wolves that used to live in California. They were kind of squeezed out by um, mechanized farming and um, land development. So taking this metaphor of like the human machine and creating it in clay. And then the eyeball being human, anthropomorphizing it, because maybe we share the same fate or we're going to squeeze ourselves out. So back to Robert Arneson, he was always someone I looked up to. 
I loved his sense of humor and his work, and he could be silly and profound at the same time, and that's something that I always strived for in my work. And these, he did a lot of these self-abasing portraits, so I was like, let me try that. So I made a portrait of myself, and then I made a mold of the portrait. I made two Wesses, cut them apart, stuck them together, and then I'm able to manipulate them after I, I stick them together, and then colored it, and then worked with some glass blower friends. And so the glass balls represent like the ideas, the ideas that you have, and the ones that float away, and the ones that you keep. Tea break. Uh, and then for my animals, or really anything that I sculpt from life, I use lots and lots of reference images. The more the better reference videos. So I'm known for my animal portraits. And the way I work is a technique I call half ass hollow. And I create a paper armature that's wrapped around a piece of wood, and then I stick the clay over that. And so it's a little bit hollow, but if you if you try to sculpt the walls really even all the way through, your sculpture can become kind of stiff. So by working kind of thick, but still hollow, I'm able to not have this crazy heavy sculpture, but I'm able to then manipulate it more freely, and then I can hollow it out at the end. I can cut it and do the rest of the hollowing. And just like any drawing, painting from life, you're gonna think big shapes first. You're gonna plan out like, okay, what's the gesture? What's the, the expression? And you're gonna look at big shapes and you're gonna work into smaller and smaller shapes. So even like the fur is a volume. It's a shape that the fur on your head, our hair is a volume, right? I would sculpt that as like a big pinch pot and then I would carve in all of the little details and break it down more and more and more until it becomes texture. And then I'll often make a mold of my animals. I'm just gonna zip through this a little bit. You gotta isolate the sections so you don't have undercuts. Make your keyholes, put the plaster on there. And then isolate the next section, pour more plaster. And if you allow the plaster to get kind of thick, you can you don't need uh, to make a reservoir for it. You can just scoop it on there. As long as you get a nice detailed layer on your first application, and then you can build up the thick stuff after that. So I will then have these molds and I pack them. So I take chunks of clay, I throw them in there, I punch them in there, and so I'll pack this whole mold with clay. And I can estimate the thickness, try to get that half inch thickness all the way through. And then I can create multiples. And I can be more loose with how I, how I render them. I can now cut it, twist it, paddle it. Oh, I messed it up. I'll make another one. So it allows me, it used to be that I would sculpt something and I would take so long to sculpt it that by the time I had it as detailed as I wanted it, I was over it, I was ready to start something new. But then with this mold process, I could do a whole series. Mm -hmm. So I make a chimpanzee and then I, I can do that series, the shaman. This was, um, was it? this one was the shaman. This one was the, the dummy like a ventriloquist dummy, and this one was the philosopher. Uh, yeah, collaborated with me on that one. And for a lot of my surfaces, I make sprig molds. I take an object that I found, object that I like the shape of, press it into the clay, or I make a plaster mold, but easier just to press it into clay, fire it, take some more clay, stick it into the mold, pull it out, and now I have a clay version of that beautiful little object. And again, 
you know, working smart and not hard, I can take these beautiful, elaborate objects that I would take like years to get that detail by myself, but because I can, I can make a whole bunch of them, I can then put them on my pottery, I can put them on other surfaces, and then I work them into the surface with more detailed sculpting so that they really feel integrated into the form. Whether that's a pot or a rhinoceros. And throwing has always been a tool that I've used. And I realized in grad school that I could make my own pedestals. So I would take a bag of clay and slap it down on the wheel and create the base. And then using coils, I can continue to work upward, building upward and upward until I get to you know three, three and a half, four feet tall. And in in about a day, I can make you know, like a, say like six hours, yeah, probably about six hours, I can make one of these tall pedestal pieces. And then I can also use that as a canvas, and the pedestal becomes a sculpture. So this was while Malia and I were artists in residence at the Palo Alto Art Center. We were doing this California native species based project where we were collaborating. She would work on, on my projects, I'd work on her projects, so she did some of the sculpting on there. And then there's the resulting piece, which is in the gallery right now. And so I wanted to end just by talking about family. <laughs> so as an artist, you have to live your life to find inspiration and meaning. And it's always a struggle to find balance between making an art, making art and living your life and creating your own stories. So besides the satisfaction of making it a little masterpiece that loves you back, you, you get to see what, what art is really all about. Like why, why we make. The urge to get your hands dirty. The sensation of being alive, to love nature, to get out there and experiment with nature, to make things, to tinker, to explore the world around you, understand how the world works, to perform and express yourself, but of course, playing with fire. <laughs> the end.